Hi, everyone. Um, welcome you to our talk, uh, How Daimler Used Mobile Mixed Realities for uh, Production Training and Sales. And um, yeah, I think, of course, continues to do so. Um, we are going to give you a short introduction about ourselves and the companies. Um, then we have, we'll have a more general look on um, what applications there are within um, the automotive industry. Um, after that, we discuss um, some challenges we faced and um, how to overcome them. And sh this we will show on some examples and uh, solutions we found. And yes, about us. Let me skip this. And if you wish to start, Sebastian. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Sebastian. I studied media and computer sciences. Uh, and that's also when I started using Unity in my free time. <laughs> and about five years ago, I joined Daimler Protix. Um, back then doing augmented reality and virtual reality and I was one of the biggest advocates for using Unity within our company. Uh, they started calling me Mr. Unity and uh, today almost everyone in our teams uses Unity on a daily basis and I'm a project manager for our HoloLens related projects. Um, yeah, and I'm Daniel, um, a VR and um, AR developer. I studied computer visualization which is a course of studies that um, so specializing on image processing and computer graphics. Um, and I've been working for um, about two years now on vi various in-car virtual and augmented reality solutions. Um, now, since um, the title says um, Daimler, I just want you to show we are from Daimler Protix. That's not the same. Um, Daimler is a huge group a worldwide group, and um, Daimler Protex is a, a wholly owned uh, Daimler IT uh, company. Um, outside of Germany, um, we're not that far right now, but um, we often feel the need to elaborate um, Daimler builds cars. Um, mostly, uh, famously, the, the Mercedes-Benz brand, but um, there are also other brand and serv services um, that belong to the um, Daimler group. Um, yes, Daimler Protex. Um, we are a company of about 700 employees. Um, we provide services exclusively to um, Daimler departments all over the world. And um, product data management is one of our core competencies. Um, but also um, media creation, virtual reality and augmented reality are um, growing fields at the moment. Um, yes, so we do um, about anything in um, the application of mixed realities within the Daimler group. So we do research, we um, develop um, consulting, meaning um, developing prototypes, proof of concepts, um, demos for auto shows, um, or um, ready to use uh, products for production and sale. Um, in order to do so, um, our skill set um, contains um, data preparation, AI, um, computer vision, 3D modeling, uh, UI, UX, and sensor fusion. And um, so in, in our team, almost everything comes together. And um, our main tool to develop is Unity. So um, all in all, we are app developers. And um, with the help of Unity, we deploy our um, applications to uh, handheld devices, smart glasses, and even projectors. Um, and now, um, let's see what sort of applications uh, we build. Yeah. So I want to provide a look at certain steps of the uh, product life cycles of um, building cars, and give a couple of examples of uh, applications that we've built for the Daimler Group. Um, for this talk, we noted down to our uh, production, training, and sales, uh, but still there are way more opportunities to use mixed reality within this kind of field. Uh, for example, in design, research and development, uh, collaboration, services, and so on. So as Daniel said, uh, Daimler builds cars, so there are big factories all over the world, and there are machines and robots and workers producing car parts and assembling cars. And uh, actually, mixed reality has a long history in production, uh, most prominently for target actual comparisons. 
So for such a comparison, you take the real thing and you superimpose engineering data and visually check if everything is all right and according to the engineering data. So you can uh, just see if everything is in the right spot or when you assemble the car, if anything is missing. And this is the kind of technology that you can use for safety inspections or for quality control. Mixed reality can also be used for, for example, for planning a factory, just as in uh, architecture, to pre-visualize big machines and layouts. Uh, and of course, also for training the workers uh, who are going to use different tools and machines and need to learn how to assemble a car. So one example for a production use case all right, here is a safety inspection of a robot cell. And what you can see are three robots in a big room. And these robots, when they are running, what they do is laser welding. So when the system is on, you have to completely close the room so no one accidentally looks inside and goes blind, which makes a safety inspection really difficult. So with this HoloLens app, you can put on the, the HoloLens and walk in there while everything is turned off. And we, do, we show a replay of actually locked robot movements. And we also display these safety spaces. Um, so it's very easy to see if the robots actually moved according to safety protocols or if anything was wrong. This is a different use case for production. In this case, uh, quality control uh, for the voice of customer audit on the A-class in China. Um, what we want to, to do here is to check all the exterior gaps and want to see if they look right. If any of these gaps are too small, if they are too, too big, if they are crooked, or anything like this. So before the employee had an app, what he actually had was he had a booklet with about 100 pages, one page for every gap, and on every page there was a, a table with all the values and tolerances so that you can look them up in this booklet. In the other hand, you would have a ruler so that you can measure at all the different measure points along uh, these gaps. So this is already quite complicated, especially as he has to, uh, result, uh, to document the results. So he still needs a another pen and a piece of paper. So with a HoloLens app, he's uh, hands-free, and he doesn't have to look up anything uh, anymore. So he can just go up to the car, uh, select any of these gaps, uh, and see directly where he has to measure these points. And at these points, we display uh, the, the value and the data that he used to look up. And um, since it's hands-free, on the other hand, he just has his uh, ruler and measure. And via the HoloLens app, you can also document the results. So it's going to be way easier for him to do this. Now, in sales, sales is a completely different environment from production. Uh, here, everything is about presentation and looks, about feelings. And the users, in this case, are not our employees anymore. So we cannot train them in using the kind of apps that we um, provide. Uh, most of the potential customers that we have have never used mixed reality before. And what we want to do, we want to create uh, exciting customer experiences related to our product, um, an experience that hopefully they will not forget. And we use these kind of apps um, to explain highlights and features of the car to potential customers. An example for that kind of app here on the HoloLens is the EQ experience for the Mercedes-Benz EQC. This is an app that can be used at auto shows or in the showroom at dealerships. And what it does, you put on the HoloLens and you get this flying ball with a speech bubble. And it is going to tell you where to look at, where to go, uh, and it will provide any information that, you, that you're going to need. So this app is self-explanatory and does not need any prior introduction. And with this guide, we tell a story and let the user move around the car to all the different points of interest that we want to show them. And we can give uh, all the kind of information, for example, technical explanations, um, like, for example, for the high voltage components or the battery that we're going to see, so that the uh, potential customer can see where actually the battery is or maybe how the battery works, can get all the needed information on that uh, topic. Um, but you can also show different things, for example, the charging of the car uh, or what services there are. So anything that is related to marketing. 
And with this kind of app, you can uh, also reach a lot of people, since this is self-explanatory, and um, five or six people, if you have six HoloLenses, can have a go at the same time. Um, similar apps like this on auto shows over a course of three or four days have been experienced by thousands of people. Um, yeah, and another example is, start the video, um, for the IAA trucks, um, an auto show for um, utility vehicles in um, Hannover in Germany. Um, we were asked to create an AR experience to show the audience the inside uh, mechanisms of a truck's powertrain. And um, it included um, several stations, uh, as you can see in the video. There was the, um, the, 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 the running engine. Um, now I think they're going to um, yeah, some users shifting gears. And you can see um, yeah, how it's running, in which gear. Um, and in a few seconds, you will see a um, oil management inside the axle. Um, there it is. Yeah, I think you will uh, see the oil uh, management um, later again. Okay, and after we sold the car, our journey does not end there. Uh, there's still after sales, and a lot of after sales focuses on maintenance and repairs, and that's where a lot of the training comes in. So for repairs, if you think about it, there are many workshops all over the country, all over the world, and uh, with every other car model, there are going to be new trainings and manuals. So there's a lot of training that needs to be done. And mixed reality is a great tool to give contextual understanding um, when learning. And you can even take this a step further and have a guided repair. So you have a step-by-step -step guide telling you exactly what to do and giving you a chance all the while to do it. So you can actually learn on the job even without prior training. Another alternative would be a remote, remote assistance. So you can have a highly specialized expert somewhere at your headquarters or somewhere in the world who are going to provide help when needed. So instead of just the telephone support, they can actually give clear instructions in mixed reality so that you can uh, do all the, all the procedures yourself. <coughs> One example for a training use case we did, in this case for the automatic nine-gear transmission, uh, is this. So historically, when doing such a training, the trainer uses these cutaway models of the real thing to, sh to give a look inside what's in there and how it works. Now, the problem is as soon as you cut it open, it will not work anymore. And this is the kind of dilemma that we can solve for using mixed reality. So what we do is we show all, all the gears and uh, little parts inside that move around. Um, and you can, for example, shift the gears and see what happens when you do so. All the while, we uh, display this uh, diagram, which is used in the, tra in the trainees' books, so they can really get an understanding of what this means and what's going on. Um, yeah, and as Sebastian started, we try to causally assign our examples uh, along the product lifecycle, um, as we are mostly working with PLM data. But um, this one stands out a bit because um, here the car itself is our mobile platform. Um, and here we work with live data um, of the car. Um, and this probably fits best to uh, research and development. So it's a bit of an excursus course here. So uh, how come um, some of you might know that in the new MBUX, so on the head unit of new Mercedes cars, there is a augmented reality navigation system included now. Um, and um, because we are already um, developing mobile mixed reality apps, we thought, okay, why not bring more of them uh, inside the vehicle? So, in this video, um, you see one outcome of fast in-car prototyping. Um, it's virtual reality, 
um, for co-driver and rear seat entertainment that we presented on IEEE's uh, VR conference uh, back in 2018. And for this presentation, we just extended our proof of concept um, um, that was uh, consisting of a number of prototypes uh, with Unity standard uh, assets and um, own built models to a uh, six degrees of freedom uh, virtual reality experience that you yeah, can experience inside a moving car. Um, the excitement was real. <laughs> yeah, I can skip a bit. So we had some kind of portals in there where you can switch the <laughs> environment. So. Um, and um, back then it was only VR because it's uh, easier to handle in a driving car, but uh, let's say they are ideas for um, AR use cases as well. Okay, as we've seen, there's a big variety of uses for mixed reality in automotive, and with it come certain challenges, especially when talking about mobile mixed reality, as we do. And as I've said before, engineers already have been using MR for years now, just that it not has been mobile. So just to uh, show you what we're coming from, or what our customers in this case are coming from, uh, when we think of augmented reality, mixed reality, we think about smartphones, tablets, or smart glasses. Uh, the engineers, they have been used to something like this. Um, this is a uh, measuring arm that's got a camera attached to its head. And with such a me measuring arm, you get a ridiculous amount of precision, less than a millimeter. And when you connect it to a big workstation, like to a real powerhouse of a computer, then you can just render cut data right from the engineering system without any changes or preparation. So this is a fantastic technology and also kind of goes to show what on a mobile device we cannot do. So on mobile, of course, performance is going to be significantly, significantly lower than uh, on what we've just seen. Uh, and also the tracking is um, heavily, heavily camera-based um, since we have to use what's built into the mobile devices um, and cannot compare to a mechanical measurement as just seen before. Uh, and so for us, this is like the first question every time we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do about performance? What are we going to do about the tracking? So coming from the different um, use cases I've shown before, also there are different challenges. For example, in production, um, as you can think, there are interfaces to very complex production and engineering systems. And out of these systems, we get quite complex data, if you think about cut data, for example. Uh, and also, engineers really love precision and numbers. This is also a big issue for us. Sales, as I've said, is very different from that. Uh, here, everything is about aesthetics, about looks. So uh, graphics is very important. A high visual quality is of the essence. And as I've demonstrated, also the ease of use. So it really needs to be effortless for someone who has never used mixed reality before to use an app like this. And if we think about the repairs, um, again, it's more or less the uh, complexity of data that we have to deal with. Because essentially, in repairs, we work with the same kind of data as we do in production. It all comes from engineering systems. And if you want to do a repair for a car, for example, um, and you've got this cut, cut data, which is very detailed, down to every single screw of the car, um, at some point, you're probably going to need all the different screws in different uh, repair instructions or repair procedures. So I want to show you some of the approaches to overcoming these kind of challenges that we faced um, on the example of uh, the app store we've just shown you. Um, and that's uh, precision, uh, for one, and uh, the complexity of data, which translates to performance, pretty much, and the systems that we have to deal with. So starting with precision, um, you really want to get the closest fit for your virtual content to the real object, in our case, a car. And you, you have to ask yourself, 
what tracking are you going to use? Um, for this example, we're going to follow along the challenges that we faced uh, when we tried to do this uh, quality control app for the HoloLens. And on there, we don't need a precision within the millimeter range. Uh, I'd say so, uh, three centimeter would be also okay. But on the HoloLens, for an object or for a hologram that's five meters long, like a whole car, this is already quite the challenge. So everyone has probably seen these before when doing AR. Uh, marker tracking is really robust and precise uh, for camera-based tracking and gives really good uh, results on handheld devices, but also on the HoloLens. Um, but you have to take in consideration, though, that uh, the tracking results are only as accurate as accurately place these markers. And for our use case, the quality control of 10 cars, 20 cars, uh, it's going to be a real pain to place 20 markers every single time for every car. So we might want to find another solution. So there's markerless tracking. Uh, most prominently SLAM-based tracking that's used in AR Kit or AR Core of, on the HoloLens, and it's really great for tracking spaces. Um, unfortunately, what it not can is uh, to align a virtual object to a real object inside of this space. So what you want to do is to place it yourself. So you can place it manually, for example, on the HoloLens by using the bounding box, and uh, I think if you have some practice, it uh, works really quite well, and the result usually is good enough. But that's not exactly precise or convenient. So ideally, what you want is that uh, you just look at the object, and the hologram automatically snaps on there. And that's something that model tracking can do. Um, and I think for us, it's the best approach, since we do not have to place any markers beforehand, or um, since this is just way easier and more convenient and faster than do it manually. Um, this technology is not, not yet as robust and accurate as, for example, the image markers. Um, but it's already come a long way over the past two years. And I think many of you might know Vuforia, um, who also does a really great job at this. Um, over the last two years, um, we've been working with uh, VisionLib and made also great experiences with this one. So we want to use the model tracking on the HoloLens for our quality uh, control use case. Now, when using model tracking on a handheld device, performance usually is good enough to use uh, this model tracking uh, to track every single camera frame, frame for frame. And if you do so, the alignment is going to be quite good, since you update the position of the, of the hologram or of the object for every single frame. Um, for the HoloLens, this is uh, too much of an impact on performance. Uh, we, we can't do that on the HoloLens. So what we do is we just use it for the initial positioning. So we look at, look at the real car, and as soon as the hologram snaps onto the car, we deactivate the uh, model tracking, and then we start anything else, all the content. The problem that we have is from the initial post, the placement, the alignment will look quite fine. So the, the silhouette is correct. But as soon as you change the angle and the position of the hologram will not get updated according to the new camera image, uh, you will see that there's going to be an offset of, let's say, 10, 20 centimeters. And another issue that we run into when talking about uh, precision on the HoloLens is uh, with the world anchors. So the world anchor, that's your point in space where uh, it gets fixed to real-world features. So right at the world anchor, it's going to be really precise and fixed in, inside this tracked space. Um, now, if you've got a really big hologram like we do, a whole car that's five meters, uh, five meters long, um, unwillingly, you've got parts that are meters away from your world anchor. So like in this um, example, if the world anchor is in the right center of the car, at the front and at the rear of the car, uh, your hologram is going to be meters away from that point. And if you stand there, it's going to move around for 10 or, 10 or 20 centimeters, something like this. So this is a way too big offset for our use case, that these uh, thin gaps are going to align with the real car. So of course, what you can do is you can place the world anchor in front of the car, and right there, the precision will improve. 
and uh, our lines might align way better there. But if we walk around the car at the rear, it's going to be just way worse. And the same goes the other way around. So, of course, logically, what you want to do is you want to have two world anchors, one for the front and one for the rear. And what we do is when you're standing in the front, we move the whole the hologram to the front world anchor. And when you move to the back, we, we move the, the hologram and attach it to the rear world anchor. This has one disadvantage. You have to do the placement of the hologram twice, once for each world anchor. So our approach for this use case was three steps. First, the employee or the user walks up to the car and we do the model tracking. The model or the hologram snaps to the real car, deactivate model tracking, and then the user goes to the front and adjust it for the front position. So when he's standing in front of the car, he's got some sliders, left, right, up, down, and so on. And as soon as for him or for her, the um, alignment looks perfect, they can walk to the back and do the same at the rear of the car. And now every time they're standing in the front of the car, we show the hologram at the adjusted front world anchor position. When they're standing at the rear of the car, we do the same for the rear. When they're standing somewhere in between, we interpolate the hologram position between the adjusted positions for the front and rear world anchor. So this is quite simple and fast uh, compared to manual placement and just consists of three simple steps. And the position is really quite good on HoloLens. So the other big factor I've already started talking about performance. Um, so performance, another factor is our rendering. And um, this is kind of the challenge when we talk about uh, the data that we have to, to handle. And I picked out two channels from the uh, use cases previously shown. Um, for one, for each use case, of course, we need to uh, think about what data do we really need to show. Since this is mixed reality, we don't have to render the whole car, but just the parts that you're going to, uh, to need or to interact with. Um, and of course, it's still about reducing the polycount of the parts that we have. Uh, so setting up a uh, level of detail pipeline is going to uh, save you a lot of pain. For example, if you want to scale your app on different devices or even within the same app to account for a different polycount budget. And if it comes to that, um, budgeting on-screen polycount is really important uh, on the HoloLens. So if we take the EQC app, for example, um, we're showing all the high voltage components of the EQC car. Uh, it's still way more than that. It's the front engine, the rear engine, uh, onboard charger, cable, and so on. So everything of that adds up to 100,000 polygons, which is already the, quite the maximum we can do on a HoloLens. Um, but now, if you click on the uh, magnifier button, we want to show the front engine in more detail. So what we do is we hide everything else and we load a different asset of the front engine with a higher poly count. So in this case, the front engine has 70,000 polygons alone. And you can have a really nice look up close. And there's still some room left so that we can throw in there an explosion view and other components. Yes, in another example um, for um, the challenge performance are uh, complex simulations. Um, one station on the earlier scene um, uh, powertrain exhibit was the oil active oil management in the rear axle. And um, so the first idea was to, okay, let's just fake it with particles, we'll be fine. But our customer wanted a um, physically correct and good looking um, simulation of that oil. So, okay, but there's no game engine that can do this on mobile in real time. So we had to find another solution. Then we said, okay, let's just render it, um, the sequences offline, and just um, replay them in our Unity scene. But um, in combination with the AR, um, that was a bit tricky, because you still need um, real-time clipping and real-time uh, elimination, depending on the user's view, uh, to really have a nice-looking hologram. Um, 
And as we are already uh, using Unity for uh, static visualizations for the UI and for um, the, the model tracking to detect these uh, different stations, um, we had to find another solution. Uh, we thought about screaming a bit, uh, streaming a bit, but in the end we came to simulate the fluids offline and just um, just visual visualize them in, in real time. So, as I said, we simulated the fluids physically correct, um, rendered several sequences, and, and then um, exported them as OBJ um, sequences. So every state of the simulation um, became an own OBJ file. Um, with this format, it was way better working inside the Unity editor. The only problem uh, left was to really import these very, very big uh, sequences into Unity and uh, work with them um, effectively, um, especially um, in terms of the chosen targets um, platforms, which were um, tablets and smartphones. And um, thanks to Unity's uh, great community, we found a plugin in the asset store um, that was or still is able to load these big OBJ sequences and um, cache them very efficiently. And uh, voila, um, there we had a physically correct and good looking um, oil simulation all running on a mobile device. Um, concerning uh, the last challenge, uh, systems or let's say system integration, uh, the in-car demo is a good example. Um, we needed to gather live data from the car itself, um, which nowadays provides a variety of informations. And um, that's where fast in-car prototyping comes into play, as we call it. Um, we work with the car-related data, um, like its six degrees of freedom pose, the wheel ticks, or the wheel angle you saw on the dummy moving, um, the steering wheel in the video. Um, and um, yes, with this data we want to directly visualize or in somehow process in our application. And uh, guess what? Unity is um, the right choice for that purpose as well. So we gather data from the inside of the car over uh, different um, connection interfaces, like um, FlexRay or Canvas are some buzzwords here. And um, additionally, we are able to connect um, external devices like tracking cameras, um, like external IMUs, like real-time kinematic systems uh, as well. Um, then we fuse um, these data and visualize it in, in with Unity. Um, in the example with the uh, rear seat entertainment, we had an um, external um, infrared camera sitting in the front to really get these six degrees of freedom inside the car. Um, yeah, and be, because of the, the great support of other companies and, and the community, it is possible to get any kind of data using uh, within Unity. Yeah, here are some examples of um, apps we build very fast to evaluate different things. Um, yes, they are not that pretty. Um, but they have fulfilled their purpose. Um, uh, just one example here, um, we evaluated map matching. Um, so we received the car's position and rotation in the real world um, via ROS into the Unity editor, and then the asset, asset store also uh, could help us with additional tools uh, besides the system integration like road builders and terrain tools. And uh, yeah, finally, um, after all systems are uh, integrated, we want to test our ideas on multiple devices. Here's uh, just a list of um, all the devices we tested inside a moving car. And yeah, uh, I definitely do not have to tell you that that is quite possible with Unity. Um, so um, thanks to the vast amount of possibilities to connect external systems and tons of plugins for any kind of need, and the ability to then bring our application to multiple different platforms, uh, we were able to fulfill our tasks very, very fast. 
And yeah, as a um, conclusion, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Unity is our development tool of choice. Um, and I hope with the shown examples you can understand why. It's um, the number one tool for development for HoloLens. Um, we could assemble a mixed reality pipeline um, to work with PLM data. Um, we could find tools for fast prototyping that suits us most. Um, and um, the community offers plugins that are in, um, essential for us or just very, very helpful. Um, so yeah, we just can't say, and we're not going to be paid for that. Um, for every problem we conf um, for every problem we were confronted with um, related to mobile mixed realities in automotive, we found a solution with Unity, and that's just great. And uh, finally, sorry, there's no slide for this, um, but we are excited to see um, in what new projects. Um, we can use Unity's new features like um, Reflect or AR Foundation, or um, better say, which new doors will open up for us um, with the help of these features. And that's it. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, if, if you've got questions, there are two microphones, and if not, we just hang out outside afterwards, can just uh, approach us and talk to us. Oh, yeah. Hi. Uh, do you have a headset deployed in daily productive work anywhere inside Daimler? I don't mean proof of concept. Uh, come again, I didn't quite understand. So do you have a headset, like AR, VR headset, mm -hmm. deployed for like productive work somewhere inside Daimler today? Um, we have quite a lot of uh, HoloLens devices within uh, Daimler for training purposes. I think there are way over 100 uh, devices just uh, in Germany alone. And like, did you guys do some like large scale testing for like the health effects of using those headsets all day long? Um, there, there have been uh, some inquiries uh, from our um, Betriebsrat. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Betriebsrat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but 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 they um, insisted on having uh, checked out these kind of effects and. Um, as far as I know, the results, the results were um, okay to use. So we're still allowed to use them. <laughs> okay, thanks. The robotic uh, example that you showed. Mm -hmm. Uh, how did you do the mod um, movement of the modeling there? Because the KUKA robots probably have a, their own protocol, and I'm wondering how do you export uh, the data from the movement of the robotic arms into the Unity model? Mm -hmm. um, so the geometry is just um, from the KUKA website. They have the cut models right there to download free. Um, the movements we got from a different production system that uh, does the logging of all the movements and. Uh, on the interface, what we get is all the rotations for every single angle of um, uh, the robot. So we had to uh, kind of write our own uh, program to get back what the current position of the single robot parts are. Nice. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so thank you again. Thanks again. Thank you very much.